Today we're going to be speaking about heat generation again in uh, piezoelectric materials. And I'm going to start out uh, by sort of explaining a paper I published a few years ago. And um, so here we go. So first I'm going to begin by discussing the methods to measure the mechanical quality factor. As we've discussed in several uh, different lectures, uh, the mechanical quality factor, or which is also the inverse of the mechanical loss, so we have the quality factor equaling the inverse of the loss factor. Um, this represents two things. At first, the quality factor represents the magnification of, of vibration and resonance. So if the quality factor is 100, you're going to get 100 times more vibration for the same applied voltage at the resonance frequency uh, rather than an off-resonance frequency. And also, uh, the quality factor, it also determines the bandwidth of operation of the material of the device. So if the um, quality factor is larger, the bandwidth, so for example, take a device. This is frequency, uh, this is vibration. Let's just go to the next page. So this is frequency, this is vibration, I'll just call it V, and we have a material with a high quality factor. So what does that look like? There. This is a high quality factor. And a material with a lower quality factor will have a response like this. So if your target vibration level was, let's say, this level, you would want to use this softer material if you wanted to have a large uh, bandwidth in which the same voltage would give a similar, uh, a similar vibration level. Your, your transducer would not have to operate at a certain frequency like right here to get a high vibration. Rather, that vibration uh, area is sort of spread out, and this is an exaggeration. This is an exaggeration, uh, but it helps illustrate the idea of bandwidth. So the quality factor can actually be calculated by the bandwidth, knowing the resonance frequency and the 3 dB bandwidth, uh, either of the impedance, so the, the impedance divided by the square root of 2, uh, would then give the uh, 3 dB uh, factor approximately. Well, it's good enough. So that the first method of measuring the quality factor is to measure this bandwidth of operation. Uh, but there are some limitations, and maybe we can discuss that later. Uh, the second method is to use the burst method, where we excite the ceramic. You know, let's, let's go to the next page. We excite the ceramic using a burst signal at its resonance frequency. So we apply such a vibration that looks like this. Let's say we apply this type of uh, resonance uh, frequency. And then we're going to have a, obviously, the ceramic. Let's just draw it like this. The ceramic is going to also vibrate. So we'll draw it in green. So it'll build up its vibration slowly at the same frequency, obviously, as, it, as the excitation. And then the, then the vibration will decay. Not exactly like that. It'll decay more like that in, a, in an exponential envelope, e to the negative, so, you know, time constant tau, something like that. And that sort of tau, the time constant, the rate of decay of the vibration after its excitation will tell you uh, the quality factor as well. So these are the two methods to measure the quality factor. The other method I want to discuss to measure the quality factor is to use temperature. And how exactly do you, how do you rate temperature and quality factor? And the reason I'm discussing this specifically is because temperature and 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 losses are extremely related and by me discussing this work of mine not only will you understand the work but you will pretty well understand the relationship between losses and heat generation and temperature so here we go so we have the quality factor the definition it's essentially a ratio between the energy stored and the, and the power dissipated uh, in a cycle of of, of oscillation so if we can populate this equation, and this equation sort of is, uh, develops from a sinusoidal uh, approach, if you can develop this equation, you can calculate and you can measure the stored energy in the material. Because the energy in an oscillator, it goes back between potential energy, which is like elastic energy, and kinetic energy, which is movement. When you have the most movement, you have the least kinetic energy. And when you have the most kinetic energy, you have the least movement. So this maybe you can understand like a spring bouncing. And when it gets to the top, it's not moving, but it has the most displacement. Therefore, it has the most elastic energy, which I'm calling potential energy. So if you measure the vibration at the edge of the sample, so we have the sample here, it's vibrating. And if you measure the edge, 
because this, the the mode shape, the vibration distribution in the material is known, you can actually calculate the energy by taking a derivative over uh, the length of this, this transducer. So you take that derivative, great, and you get this value. It looks really cool. V vibration velocity, RMS squared, times the density of the material, the area, the length over 2. That's the total energy. How do you get the actual en the energy density? You divide by the volume. Okay. So in this figure, I'm showing the fundamental vibration mode shape of a K31 resonator operating in resonance conditions. Uh, so the displacement and also the vibration, because the vibration is the is the derivative of displacement. And the derivative is, uh, you know, if you take the derivative, you just get an omega term out and you keep your uh, general formulation. So the fundamental vibration mode shape is a sinusoidal curve uh, where you have the most vibration or displacement on the edges and you have the least in the middle. However, strain is a completely different uh, thing. If the strain, if you integrated the sinusoidal curve, you'd get a cosine type of curve. And this cosine would tell you that the strain is the maximum in the middle and the least at the edges because the edges are free vibration ca free cases because they have no uh, attached structure therefore stress cannot really be applied on the edges therefore uh, you have no strain on the edges and you have strain mo the most strain in the middle so this is how the displacement and the strain develop the losses in the material are not due to the kinetic energy losses in the material this is like a bold if I could bold it I would bold it uh, if I could emphasize it enough I would emphasize it enough that the uh, losses in the material are occurring because of elastic energy change not because of kinetic energy change so although this formulation tells us the stored energy at resonance the potential energy equals the kinetic energy so this is sort of a simple way to find out the energy stored in the material so here we have uh, the elastic energy which is related to the strain the strain squared because we know from a you know typical uh, we call it spring constant formulation where we're talking about the potential energy stored in a spring we have one half times the k constant times x squared x squared here is the strain so not dis displacement is not I mean, when we're considering the material property we're talking about strain and strain is generating that uh, stored energy. So if we if we can measure the power dissipated, or we can find figure it out somehow, and we can you know, and I, I told you how to measure the energy stored is by measuring the edge vibration. Uh, we can actually calculate the quality factor, knowing the frequency as well. So this one also thing to which I want to explain to you is that if you increase the frequency of your resonating device, let's say you have two devices, both have the same, both are made of the same material. We have a device, let's say, which is, uh, let's call this 20 millimeters in length. And you have a device which is 40 millimeters in length, it's a little bit longer, I don't know. Okay, 40 millimeters in length. This one have a, let's say, a resonance frequency of 100 kilohertz. And this one will have a resonance frequency of 40 kilohertz. And they're both made in the same material, so they both have the same quality factor. Which one will have more heat generation? Which one will have higher temperature rise? The exact answer lies in this frequency term. Because you designed this to have a higher frequency, there are more cycles per second. More cycles per second means more energy loss per time. More energy loss per time means more heating and more hotness. In other words, more temperature increase just because you designed your transducer to be smaller. So if you really want to fool the people who are uh, looking at your data, make a big transducer. Therefore, the resonance frequency will be small. Therefore, the heat generation will be minimal. But that's not what I'm talking about here. The power dissipation is equal to the heat generation due to losses. So if somehow we were able to measure the heat, the losses, and the heat generated in the system, we could find the quality factor. However, you can't just put a probe to measure heat generation. We, with regards to heat generation, we can only measure temperature. So how can we convert temperature into heat generation information? And hey, this is a nice picture of the of the uh, losses here. I think this is this is probably the actual case of the system where we have uh, 300 millimeters per second. Tip vibration, we're getting about 36 uh, degrees, 16 degrees in temperature rise C. So, 
And as you see here in this thermal camera image, the lightest part is in the middle. The darkest part is in the end. And I'm going to explain why that is, but mainly it's because the strain distribution says that the most energy is stored in the middle. Therefore, the most energy is lost in the middle. Therefore, the most heat is generated in the middle. Therefore, the temperature is highest in the middle. Okay, and here's the paper which I was talking about. If you type in uh, these names, you'll find the paper. So here we have a heat transfer model, and this is a model which was run in MATLAB using a differential, partial differential equation, time dependent, solver thingy. So we have here, our, at the beginning, uh, if we want to have our transducer that has not been operated, it has a, it, it has a uniform temperature, right? If you measure the temperature across this transducer, or I'm calling it transducer, it's just a piezometric material, I work on that, so I talk about that. So the temperature is constant. If you draw a temperature plot, the temperature and this is temperature is constant across the entire spectrum. Uh, but for here, obviously, you can tell that the temperature was most in the middle. So the temperature starts a constant value, you know, across one of these dotted lines. But then as time goes on, it develops into a sort of sinusoidal type of curve. And this is not necessarily sinusoidal. It has a lot of things to do with it. Uh, it, it's developed from a sinusoidal curve, but remember, strain is strain squared is energy, and energy is loss. When you put in energy to a, to or you transfer kinetic energy to elastic, or you take out from elastic, you lose energy. Therefore, that is going to look like the strain distribution, but it's going to be strain squared. So we have the shape as cosine squared. And here, look at that coming up cosine squared. So this is the equation basically describing the heat transfer in the system. We have conduction, heat diffusion here, which over time ends up being heat, heat conduction. We have heat generation being seen here, where this is the heat generated. And this is the uh, specific heat, because you put in heat to a material or energy, you may heat one material more than the other. For example, you know, air has a lower specific heat than water. So if you put the same amount of heat into the same amount of air, you're going to heat the air more than you're going to heat the water. Therefore, uh, you know you have the same amount of energy, and we know how how, how that works. Here's the heat dissipation factor, and this is the convection coefficient, this HD. This is radiation term, you know, to the fourth, and has this E and sigma and stuff, and this is the uh, time dependent transient term. So over time, the heat evens out. We see temperature, position and time here. Over well, about a couple of minutes it takes for the time to reach its maximum value. So this might you might know if you want to do heat generation experiments you should wait a few minutes at least initially so the heat can get generated. He can uh, be substantiated. But usually when you're doing experiments it's already that hot anyway. You already wait that long anyway pretty much. So here's a little bit more about the heat transfer in piezoelectric ceramics. So we have a couple of different mechanisms interacting, but now I'll discuss that in the next lecture.